Do you ever feel tired, foggy, or constantly fighting off little illnesses, even when you're eating well and trying to stay healthy? Or maybe you're dealing with stubborn weight, mood dips, and just not sleeping as well as you used to. While it's easy to blame this on stress, hormones, or just getting older, there's one often overlooked nutrient that could play a huge role in this, and that is vitamin D. Hi, I'm Sonia Hollis, a qualified nutritional therapist, and today we're going to be diving into the real science behind vitamin D and why it affects more than just your bones. We'll cover how your body actually makes and uses vitamin D and what can block that process. I'll explain the signs of deficiency and how vitamin D impacts your immunity, mood, inflammation, metabolism and cardiovascular health. Plus, you'll learn what tests matter, how to supplement safely, the different forms available and how your genes could be impacting your vitamin D status without you even realising it. But before we jump in, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you never miss any more of these science-backed health tips. So let's get started. Vitamin D is technically a fat-soluble vitamin, but functionally it behaves more like a hormone. Your body makes it from cholesterol when your skin is exposed to sunlight, specifically UVB rays. It then goes through two important steps. The liver converts it into 25-hydroxyvitamin D, and this is the form most commonly tested in blood work. The kidneys, and in some cases immune cells, convert it into the active form 125-dehydroxyvitamin D, which your body uses to regulate everything from calcium metabolism to immune function and gene expression. To help you visualize that, here's a simple overview showing how vitamin D is made in the body and the common factors that can reduce absorption or synthesis like limited sun exposure, darker skin, age, body fat, genetics, and even certain medications. Most people still associate vitamin D with bones, and yes, it helps you to absorb calcium and maintain strong skeletal health, but that is just the tip of the iceberg. Vitamin D plays a crucial role in immune regulation, so helping your body fight off infections more effectively while also reducing chronic low-grade inflammation that contributes to long-term disease risk. It helps with mood and mental clarity. Vitamin D supports brain health by influencing serotonin production and interacting with receptors in areas of the brain involved in mood, focus and emotional regulation. It also helps with our blood sugar and metabolic health. So improving insulin sensitivity, which helps with stable energy, reduced cravings and long-term metabolic balance. It also plays a role in fat distribution and cardiovascular health. Vitamin D status is linked to how fat is stored in the body, particularly the visceral fat around the midsection, and may play a role in supporting healthy blood vessels and blood pressure. And lastly, cell growth and apoptosis. So vitamin D influences how cells grow, repair and when they self-destruct through a natural cleanup process called apoptosis and which is why it's been actively studied for the role in cancer prevention and immune surveillance. It even influences how you process homocysteine which ties into heart and brain health. So how do you know if you're low? Vitamin D deficiency is incredibly common, especially in people who spend a lot of time indoors use sunscreen daily, have darker skin, carry more body fat, take certain medications, or live in northern climate or during the winter months. Symptoms can be vague, low energy, frequent illnesses, mood changes, muscle pain, poor recovery, and even stubborn belly fat, all linked to insufficient vitamin D. So let's talk numbers. A blood level of 30 nanograms per milliliter or 75 nanomoles per liter is generally considered the minimum for sufficiency, but that's just to avoid deficiency, not necessarily to support optimal health. 
Research suggests that 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter or 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter supports immune and metabolic function. 50 to 80 nanograms per milliliter or 125 to 200 nanomoles per liter may reduce risks for heart disease, cancer and mood disorders. Anything above 100 nanograms per milliliter, that's 250 nanomoles per liter, should be monitored closely, especially alongside calcium levels. Vitamin D toxicity is uncommon but can result from excessive supplementation. So levels exceeding 150 nanograms per milliliter or 375 nanomoles per liter have been associated with adverse effects, including hypercalcemia. The best way to understand your vitamin D status is to test your blood levels, specifically a 25 hydroxy vitamin D test. But if you're supplementing and your levels still aren't improving or you're not feeling the expected benefits, don't just assume it's a problem with absorption. Sometimes your genes can play a part too. Some people have small genetic variations called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and that affects how their bodies process and respond to vitamin D. So the relevant ones are the VDR gene, this affects how well vitamin D can activate inside your cells. We have the CYP2R1 gene, which influences how your liver converts vitamin D into its usable circulating form. And then lastly, we have the GC gene, and this is your vitamin D binding protein, which helps transport it through the blood. Now, I've seen this in my own test results. So in my own nutrigenomic test, I found that I have a good transporter gene, which means vitamin D circulates well in my body. But I also carry two low sensitivity VDR variants, which reduce how strongly my body responds to vitamin D at a cellular level. So even with good levels in my blood, I may need a higher dose for a longer time to truly feel the benefits like better mood, immunity or energy. So if you have one or more of these SNPs, you may need a higher or more consistent dose of supplementation to reach optimal levels. You might be slower to respond to standard supplementation or benefit from specific delivery forms like sprays, oil-based capsules or sublingual drops. And you may need to monitor your blood levels alongside your symptoms, not just go by the numbers. And this is where a nutrigenomic test, along with support from a qualified practitioner, can help you personalize your vitamin D approach safely and effectively. I'll pop a link in the description below if you want to know more about nutrigenomic testing. Let's break down the most common supplement types and which ones are most effective. The most effective form is vitamin D3, and this is the same form your body produces when your skin is exposed to sunlight. Avoid vitamin D2 unless specifically prescribed. It's less potent, has a shorter half-life, and doesn't raise blood levels as effectively in D3 in most people. You'll find vitamin D3 in several formats. We have the soft gels, which are oil-based. These are well absorbed, especially when taken with food. Sprays or liquid drops. These are ideal for people with digestive or fat absorption issues, like after a gallbladder removal or in IBD cases. Or dry tablets or capsules. These may be less effective in individuals with poor fat digestion and less micro-encapsulated. Because it's a fat-soluble vitamin, always take vitamin D with a meal that contains some healthy fat, even a small amount of olive oil, oily fish, nuts or avocado can improve absorption significantly. You may have noticed that many high-quality vitamin D3 supplements now include vitamin K2, and there's a very good reason for that. These two nutrients work synergistically to support both bone strength and cardiovascular protection, but they each play a distinct role. Vitamin D3 helps your body absorb calcium from food and supplements. 
and vitamin K2 helps direct that calcium into the right places like bones and teeth and away from arteries, joints and other soft tissues. So here's what's happening behind the scenes. Vitamin D3 boosts the production of vitamin K dependent proteins, especially osteocalcin, which helps bind calcium into your bone matrix and MGP, which prevents calcium from being deposited in artery walls. But these proteins only become active through a process called carboxylation, and that requires vitamin K2. If K2 is lacking, these proteins stay inactive. So even with plenty of vitamin D and calcium, calcium can still end up in the wrong places. So this synergy is particularly important if you're supplementing with 2000 IU or more of D3 daily, you're also taking calcium supplements, or you're concerned about osteoporosis, bone loss or arterial stiffness. So here are some forms of vitamin K2 and what to look for. Look for K2 as MK7. It's the most bioavailable and long acting form. MK4 is another form that has a shorter half-life and is often used in higher therapeutic doses. MK7 source form fermented soybeans is commonly used in supplements as well. A combined D3 and K2 formula is especially useful for anyone supplementing over 2000 IUs a day or those with a history of osteopenia or osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, calcium or vitamin D supplementation, or postmenopausal or at a higher risk of arterial stiffness. So can you get enough from food and sunlight alone? Sunlight is still the best natural source. Just 20 minutes of midday exposure in summer can produce between 10,000 to 25,000 IU of vitamin D. But depending on your skin tone, latitude and season, this might not be enough year round. Good food sources include cod liver oil, sardines and mackerel with bones for the extra calcium, pasture raised eggs, and also UV exposed mushrooms, especially for plant based eaters. And this is predominantly D2. But most people will still benefit for some level of supplementation, especially through the autumn and winter. With regards to supplementation, here's a general guide, but always tailor it to individual needs and test them. 2,000 to 4,000 IUs a day, typically a maintenance level for most adults. 6,000 to 10,000 IUs per day is a therapeutic range for deficiency, obesity, malabsorption or certain SNPs. And 50,000 IUs per week sometimes used as a short-term basis under supervision. And just make sure that you're retesting every three to six months, especially if you're supplementing over 4,000 IUs per day. And if you're supplementing over long periods or combining it with calcium, please also make sure to also monitor your serum calcium levels to avoid any risk of hypercalcemia. So to summarize, Vitamin D is one of the most powerful, affordable and underutilized tools that we have for supporting long term health, including your immune system, mental well-being, metabolic balance and inflammation. But for it to work well, you need the right dose, format, the cofactors and context. So get tested. Don't guess. Choose D3, not D2. Take it with fat and ideally with magnesium and vitamin K2 and pay attention to your genetics, your symptoms and your follow up results. Remember, your vitamin D needs might be as unique as you are. So testing, personalization and choosing the right supplement can make all the difference. That's it for now. Thank you so much for watching and if you found this helpful, please make sure to like, subscribe and check out my other videos for science-backed nutrition tips. That's it. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.